All right, so we'll go ahead and get started today. Um, thank you all for having the time to be here with us to talk about 2024 cultural heritage. This is our grantee convening to allow us to kick off the new 2024 year. Um, but before we get into everything cultural heritage, I do want to allow for Maya, my fellow grants manager, to get us started with our land acknowledgement and our CAC equity values. So Maya, can you please get us started? Yes, thanks, Devon. Hi, everyone. Hi, Robin. I saw you just entered. Good to see you. Um, yeah, before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the land that we stand on and the place that we call Cuyahoga County is land that was claimed by the United States government through force, displacement, and treaties negotiated in bad faith. We acknowledge those of the Shawnee, Miami, Erie, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Haudenosaunee Confederacy whose lands we stand on and the thousands of Native Americans representing over a hundred tribes who currently live in Northeast Ohio today. Thank you to Lake Erie Native American Council for providing us the information to develop this acknowledgement. And then we also want to take a moment to acknowledge CAC's value of equity. We lead with racial equity in our work because the creation and perpetuation of racial inequalities is embedded into government and grant making. We confront the white supremacy that resides in our work because racial inequities across all indicators of success are deep and pervasive. We also recognize the power and potential that organizations who produce arts and cultural programming have as bearers of culture. These institutions have the power to write the narrative about who belongs and who is valued. We encourage arts organizations to connect with resources to advance equity in your own work um, and to visit cacgrants.org slash equity or contact our team to learn more. And with that, I will pass it back to Devon. Thank you, Maya. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about today's agenda. Um, today, we'll go ahead and talk about uh, CAC, uh, what we do um, about cultural heritage, our funding criteria, and some peer trends that we found from some data that we collected, uh, cultural heritage requirements and payment timeline, and as well as SMARTY goals that we'll get into. Cuyahoga Arts and Culture is the public funder for arts and culture organizations in Cuyahoga County and has invested more than 246 million in more than 486 organizations since 2006. Cuyahoga County residents created Cuyahoga Arts and Culture in 2006 when they approved a tax on cigarettes to support arts and culture in our community. This levy was renewed in 2015 and now runs through 2027. Our mission is to inspire and strengthen the community by investing in arts and culture. Cuyahoga Arts and Culture archives its mission by investing in 501c3 arts and culture organizations and projects in Cuyahoga County. We are proud to announce that in 2024, CAC is investing almost $11.3 million through grants to a record-breaking 300 organizations who will bring art and culture to our life in our community. As a board of five individuals appointed by the county executive and a staff of seven, um, I want to go ahead and introduce, introduce you guys to our grants team. I, Davon Nichols, um, with Julia and Maya are the grant managers. We each have a portfolio of about 100 organizations that we work with uh, through a grant cycle. One of us is your grant manager. If you're not sure who your grant manager is, we will provide a PDF and links to allow you to be able to share uh, to see that at the end of this presentation. Your grant manager is here to help. We can help you find materials that you need, old applications or reports, for example, offer guidance around completing requirements. We will surely be sending you reminders throughout the year, and we can help make connections between organizations. Also wanna give a shout out to Jake, our Director of Grant Making, Strategy and Communications, as well as Laura Mateo, who is also our Associate Grants Making and Communication Specialist, or Associate, sorry. Now that you know who we are, let's see who is here today. So please feel free to introduce yourself either by taking yourself off of mute or in the chat, you can share your name and pronouns, the role at your organization, the organization that you're representing, 
and a small bonus if you feel free, if you want, to share your favorite program or event from your organization. Since I'm already unmuted, I'll go ahead and speak. My name is Donna Berry. I am, what do you do, she, her, okay? And I am the Administrative Director of Majuba Dance Collective in Cleveland. Um, we are a dance organization that uses dance as a means for um, collaboration, healing, um, spiritual health, and welfare. Our, my favorite program we really haven't done since um, COVID, and we are trying to do it again. It used to be an annual or biannual uh, production that we, original production that we do called um, How I Got Over, um, a cultural uh, tribute of faith, a journey of faith, I'm sorry. And what we do is we take, um, we accept everyone who wants to be in this program from the community. Um, so if anybody who comes, we find a role for them. And what we do is an uh, evening of dance, song, poetry, um, a very, very professional production. A lot of people have said that um, they have never been in a, this type of production. Some of the dancers are already experienced, professional dancers, and some of the people have only done a line dance at a wedding. So, um, you know, we bring them all together, regardless of age, from five to 95, we find a part for them. There's an entire process that we go through that involves um, learning the history, um, behind the dances and the things that uh, people will experience that evening. And it is just a life-changing experience for the people that are involved. So hopefully we will be able to get that uh, reestablished. We have not done it since the pandemic. Um, since the pandemic, and this will be the last thing, my favorite program is we started um, last year taking um going into the nursing homes and working with seniors to get them moving and get them involved and to uh sh let them share their stories and that has just been uh, a wonderful experience so i'm gonna go on mute thank you for that i love that thank you for sharing would anyone else like to come off of mute or uh, please? Yeah, I will. I would absolutely want to get involved with Donna's program. <laughs> it sounds awesome. I know, right? Uh, my name is Robin Robinson, pronouns she, her, um, wonderful woman. <laughs> uh, my role is the executive director of Sankofa Fine Art Plus. Uh, Sankofa is a not-for-profit, of course. Uh, we are, are an ethnic arts organization. We have been in, around since 1999, and this year is our 25th um, anniversary, uh, which is awesome also. Uh, we used to do, um, in the past, from 2000 to 2011, we did a Black Arts Expo uh, at Tri-C East. So it was well attended, a massive production. Um, 2011 was the last one and it's because of the, the uh, production part of it. We just couldn't maintain that, that uh, finance. So we started at that point on 2013, we started um, what I developed uh, urban Renaissance with Heart, which we started doing public art um, with community engagement to bring the fine art out of, <clears throat> excuse me, out of the gallery elitist type of situation into the public. So with um, community engagement, uh, we would do uh, uh, murals in that, in different communities. And with community engagement, I mean that we would actually go about asking the community what they wanted to see on their walls. And we would then use them 
as uh, catalysts, their opinion and their labor to um, actually put these murals on the walls. Also with, you know, um, didn't matter whether they could pick up a paintbrush or ever had before, we uh, made it so that everybody in spite of skill level could do that. So my favorite program would then be um, Urban Renaissance with Heart. I mentioned the, the expo uh, before because we would like to bring it back this year as um, a celebration of our 25th anniversary. Uh, so, you know, that, that's just something that is in the works. And I absolutely, you know, you, CAC will hear more about it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's something that we've been working on. And we already have Tri-C on board, Tri-C East, and a couple other um, partners that uh, we'll be talking to you guys about soon. Thank you, Robin, and congrats on the 25th year. That's a huge milestone. Thank I can't you. wait to see if you guys are able to bring that back. I'm sure, like you said, we'll hear about it, um, but thank you for, for sharing. Um, I'm looking into the chat to see if anyone has anything else. I can go. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, Lauren Calavich here. Sorry, I'm not on camera. A uh, little under the weather today. So, um, I am uh, Lauren Calavich. She, her, hers, and my role is on the executive committee of Cleveland Korentovania, uh, which is part of the Slovenian Museum and Archives. Uh, we reside in the Saint Clair uh, Superior neighborhood, and we host the Cleveland Korentovania Festival, which ostensibly is a um, Slovenian Mardi Gras festival uh, that tries to bring the all kinds of culture to um, sharing the Slovenian culture in the St. Clair Superior neighborhood. Um, our mission is to not only to share that, but to bring people that don't often come to the St. Clair Superior neighborhood down there and um, to learn about um, our culture there. Um, I, it's, it's our sort of flagship event and it's definitely my favorite that we do the slovenian museum and archives also has regular um, art exhibits and stuff like that but that is our large event that we do we're actually gearing up for it now um and you know we try to get as many folks in the neighborhood involved um just in open attendance um most of our events throughout the week leading up to the big festival day are all uh, free and open to the public and the festival is totally free and open to the public as well. We offer a lot of kids activities throughout the day um, and it's a great way to just come and spend time with the family. Um, and we also have a lot of vendors who are involved uh, from the neighborhood who, you know, either selling food or selling um, things that they they make, uh, stuff like that. So thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for that, Lauren. I can't wait to see how that all turns out for you this year. Let's see who else we have in. Um, I could jump in. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Josiah Brid. He, him, is executive director of Collective Express. And we use art, culture, performance art um, as a way to engage residents normally in their own neighborhoods and during the course of their normal lives. Um, my favorite program of ours would be when we couple our performance and visual arts with basic needs outreaches. Um, so that could look like, uh, you know, us doing pop-up programs at food pantries uh, where you tend to catch people off guard, but in a good way and uh, you're able to share, you know, some cultural offerings um, and experiences. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. 
Um, I did want to uh, note uh, Josiah is one of our newer uh, grantees um, to cultural heritage this year. Uh, most of our uh, grantees are returning. Um, we'll get more into the timeline of that, but let's welcome uh, Josiah and Collective Express um, for joining the group. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right, um, taking a look, I think that is everyone who is present today. So we'll go ahead and move forward um, with the presentation. So about cultural heritage. Cultural heritage's purpose is to strengthen the community by providing flexible support to organizations that are representative of a culturally specific population. This is a multi-year core support grant that ranges from $5,000 to $30,000. The award amount is determined by your organization's average revenues of the two most recently completed fiscal year operating budgets. This amount is then factored in with the total budget allocated for cultural heritage grants for the year and adjusted based on the number of organizations in the award pool. You all are a part of the 2024 through 2025 funding period, meaning that this year you will not need to reapply for 2025 funding. However, in the summer of 2025, so next year, uh, you will be provided the opportunity to reapply for a, um, cultural heritage funding. So speaking of that, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Julia to discuss our criteria and some trends that we found in the data that we pulled from our goal statements in 2023. Julia, please take it away. Thank you. So the funding criteria, these are the characteristics that new applicants are assessed for. So Josiah and Collective Express went through the application process this year um, and their application was assessed around these. And they're also what returning grantees, so the rest of you and your organizations, are expected to demonstrate through your reporting. CAC's three funding criteria are public benefit, artistic and cultural vibrancy, and organizational capacity. So public benefit is an organization's ability to meaningfully connect with its community to achieve its mission. And you'll see the text here below, it shows some common trends that we saw among cultural heritage grantees. Um, so around aiming to cater to the specific demographic groups that their organizations serve, uh, but also aiming to reach audiences outside of those demographics, for example. Several organizations recognized that diverse crowds lead to broader understanding of your organization's purpose and increased cultural exchange. So these are great goals to have regarding, you know, part of public benefit being accessible and inviting to your community and the broader public. Artistic and cultural vibrancy is an organization's ability to create relevant and engaging work that furthers its mission. Some examples from 2023 include enhancing or expanding general programming, as well as collaborations or partnerships within the community. This is the perfect time to look at your peers' programs and see what you can learn from each other. A great way to stay informed on each other is by start signing up for our recurring, our bi-weekly newsletter, which we'll speak more about soon. But going back to collaborations and partnerships, they're a great way to help build the capacity of arts and arts and culture professionals and to help each other thrive there, which falls under that, that criteria. And lastly, organizational capacity is an organization's ability to successfully plan for and manage its resources. Several of these organizations in the pool here work towards building the capacity of your boards and your staff. So things like recruiting, maintaining, and training board or staff members to help carry out your initiatives more efficiently. So we recommend, you know, as the grant year is starting, you take a look at the full criteria and their descriptions, which are available in our guidelines, giving that a good, a good read. Because regardless of whether you had to apply this year or not, all cultural heritage grantees are expected to show evidence of the funding criteria through your reporting, which we'll get to shortly. Um, these can be found on page six of the guidelines, and we will send a link um, with that uh, when we share this presentation later. Um, but for now, let's move on to a common term that shows up in our funding criteria's definitions, which is the word belonging. So, the concept of belonging intersects with our funding criteria 
and is a value that CAC holds close, in particular around public benefit, the first and most, emphasis, most emphasized of our funding criteria. We define this and several other important terms in our glossary, which is linked in the guidelines and in this presentation, which we'll share. The glossary includes words like diverse, sharing power, community, and, and others. So belonging is about an unwavering commitment to not simply tolerating and respecting difference, but to ensure that all people are welcome and feel that they belong in a given space. This illustration here, which comes from John A. Powell and the Othering and Belonging Institute is a great example of that. Belonging is not just about inviting people into the circle, but expanding it or bringing more chairs in, for example. It's about bridging between differences rather than requiring people to change or integrate. It's about co-creating and co-owning. So in organizations and institutions, this concept should be present at all levels, not just in an education or outreach department, but especially in leadership where power is held. Belonging in practice will look different at every organization, but it won't include things like tokenizing, extractive partnerships with smaller organizations, or outreach programs into communities where you have no relationships built. I found the materials from the Othering and Belonging Institute to be super practical and understandable and very helpful in our work at CAC. And so we will share a link to the, their materials as well at the end. And I'm going to pass it back to Davon. Thank you, Julia. Um, so now we'll go ahead and move over to the requirements and payments timeline. So your requirements are going to help you plan for when to expect your grant payments. To receive your first grant installment for 2024, you must have the following completed. You have to have signed your grant agreement for 2024, have completed your 2024 goals form, which we'll speak a little bit more about later, uh, and then returning cultural Heritage grantees must also have their 2023 Cultural Heritage Final Report um, completed as well. I'm missing the end part. Um, please note that your first installment will not be dispersed no earlier than January 31st. Speaking of which, that is the day that your final report and your goals forms are due. For this year, the cultural heritage recipients do not need to worry about the eligibility check as your grant is for 2024 and 2025. However, you will have to complete um, a mid-year mid check-in with your grant managers. You should also expect a two to three week turnaround time for the disbursement of your funds. Also, the closer you wait to a deadline date, the more of a chance to delay that disbursement. Also note, if you're having any complications with submitting anything uh, to CAC, it is advised to reach out to us as soon as possible. Overdue requirements can lead to a warning and a reduction to your grant amount or even withdrawal from the grant as stated in your grant agreements. So let's go ahead and talk about our funding requirements. Cultural heritage grants are matching grants and a one-to-one -one cash match is required. Grantees should leverage CAC funds to secure additional income from other sources. The matching funds may come from any source besides other funds from CAC. Um, foundation or government grants, private donations, ticket sales, etc. Next is the credit requirements. All CAC grantees are required to acknowledge CAC funding in their publicly funded arts and culture programming. By sharing with audiences that your program was funded by the residents of Cuyahoga County through CAC, you're showing that the public funding for the arts can do it in real time. Your grant is important advocacy to help champion public funding. You can do this in many ways, in your printed programs or website, um, through a pre-show announcement, in your marketing emails, or even uh, for venues and exhibit signages. And for events calendar, grant recipients are also required to post events on clevelandartsevents.com. This site is a live and managed events calendar of arts and culture events happening in the greater Cleveland area. It's visited by thousands of Cuyahoga County residents each month and is a great opportunity to reach a wider audience. Cultural heritage grantees shall have at least one active event posted for each month at, um, at the organization's public funding, pro programming, apologies. 
So for example, if you have five programs in March, uh, you must post at least one of them. Um, you don't have to post all of them. CAC pulls from the calendar for our bi-monthly e-news, e -news, our social media posts and media partnerships. So it's an extra benefit of using this resource. These requirements are outlined with clear instructions in the credit expectations handout that we will share um, towards the end of this presentation as well. Further on clevelandartsevents.com, this helps residents connect with Cuyahoga County's vibrant arts and cultural scene. By posting your events on this community calendar, you are not only meeting the terms of your grant agreement, but you are demonstrating public benefit and connecting with county residents. All grantees have profiles created for use. Should you have any issues accessing your account or need assistance with crediting materials, please reach out to us and we will get to uh, assist you as you may need. Also, in the chat, um, I am going to go ahead and give you guys um, a link um, at the end of this. But we wanted to mention that uh, Cleveland Arts and Events has a Lunch and Learn happening on January 24th from 12 to 1 p.m. Here you can learn more about the features and tools at your disposal for promoting and finding events, opportunities, local artists, space, and more. Now moving to funding restrictions. This long list here are things that you cannot spend CAC funds or. So for example, programs or activities outside of Cuyahoga County, activities that aren't open to the public, fundraising events, re-granting, scholarships or awards, food or receptions, capital improvements, advocacy. There are several others as you can see from the list. Um, but you can find the comprehensive list in your uh, CAC grant agreement on page 11 of the 2020 or on page 11 of the 2024 Cultural Heritage Guidelines. So speaking of funding restrictions, now here are the things that are allowed for use. Um, a way shorter list, but a little bit more encompassing. So this is for your general programming costs. Um, your administrative staff, supplies, and planning. Unlike with project support, where you must spend your funds on a specific project, the Cultural Heritage Grant is more flexible for any of your arts and culture-related programs or activities. If you have any questions about eligible, eligible grant uses, please contact your grant manager for assistance. So earlier we mentioned um, on the requirements timeline, something about your final reports. If you started your final report for 2023, you may have noticed a new inquiry. This will be new for those who are entering cultural heritage this, uh, this year as well. CAC will begin to require revenue and expense reports for your most recently ended fiscal year, as well as projected revenues and expenses for your current fiscal year with your regular reporting. This will supplement 990 data that CAC collects to understand your organization's finances. Organizations with fiscal year end date between January 1st through June 30th will report their completed financial information, revenue and expenses for their FY 2024 and projected revenue and expenses for fiscal year 2025 at their mid-year uh, check-in. That'll be due um, typically by July 31st, 2024. Organizations with a fiscal year end date between July 1st through December 31st will report their completed financial information, revenue and expenses for their fiscal year 2024 and projected revenue and expenses for fiscal year 2025 at the end um, of this year. So that will be due um, by January 31st of 2025 in your final report or your year in report. For those of you who are returning cultural heritage grantees, a request for your 2023 actual revenue and expenses and 2024 projections appeared in your final report, but is completely optional for now. However, please note that you will have to submit this financial data in future reports. 
We will have ample communications to gear you up for those deadlines, but should you have any questions, we are definitely here to assist you. Okay, so now that we have talked about the new updates for the final report, um, I wanted to have some time to talk about um, our SMARTY goal setting. So this is an important aspect of completing your goals report, also due January 31st. I want to break down the compartments of the SMARTY goals, as well as review some hypothetical questions to assist with fine-tuning your SMARTY goals um, that you will set for yourself in your goals report. So as you can see on the screen, a SMARTY is an acronym that stands for strategic, measurable, ambitious, realistic, time-bound, inclusive, and equitable. So for strategic, we wanna ask ourselves, does this help us to achieve our mission and vision statement? An example would be if CAC funds nonprofits for arts and culture, um, but we will not fund cancer campaigns. It's a great cause, but it's unrelated to our purpose. For measurable, can the results be described in specific terms like size, amount, duration, impact, or interactions? For example, a better work environment can make my staff happier versus we will allocate quarterly check-ins to address needs as they come up. So we see how we're taking a general um, idea and kind of specifying um, the different components of that goal. For ambitious, does it challenge us and motivate us for success? For example, we will hire new diverse board members versus we will bring in board members to help guide us in these particular subjects. For realistic, is this sensible and practical of what our capacity allows? An unrealistic example would be, we will double our revenues by 2025 by continuing our current programming. For time bound, are we aiming for completion or progress? And by when, for example, to, ex to expand our general programming versus by June, 2024, we will launch our new or have completed our new. For inclusive, does this exclude any of the parties or groups affected by this goal? For example, moving to a new facility but not considering ADA compliance for your staff or audience. And for equitable, does the outcome lead to more flexibility to address and relieve the needs of everyone affected? Continuing from the last example, speaking to a consultant about ADA accessibility before making your final decision. Try to keep some of these inquiries in mind as you complete your 2024 goals report due January 31st. Be sure to use your strategic plan and plug in goals that your organization already has. The idea isn't that you're making extra work for a CAC, but showing that the work that you have planned to do already this year aligns with your goals. So this pretty much concludes our your presentation today. Again, congratulations on your funding. If you must go, please feel free to drop out um, for the next few moments. We'll allow for an open discussion session. Um, I have a few prompts at the end um, to go off of the discussion, but it's intended for everyone to be able to speak about um, anything or have any questions to be answered. Um, and lastly, yeah. I'll go ahead and give you guys a link for of uh, the learn opportunity. Yes, Julia. There were a couple questions that got brought up in the chat that I'll just voice now as well. Okay. One question was around if an organization does not have an event in a given month, but they're supposed to post on the events website, what should they do? And the, the answer is that if you're not hosting any public programs in a given month, then you are not required to post anything for that month. Um, it's the wording is kind of confusing around that, but basically if you are hosting public programming in any given month, you should definitely post then at least one, one program. Um, and another question was around whether CAC has any, um, like pamphlets or signage or materials that can be, 
um, posted or shared at their programming. And yes, um, Laura, Laura made note that we we do have flyers and signage, we have um, handouts, and we are hoping to even have some new, new materials coming soon. So that's something that you can reach out to your grant manager ahead of your program um, if you'd like to be able to share any CAC materials at your event. So thank you for asking that question. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so with that being said, I just wanted to show you guys, um, you guys will receive follow-up emails. So these are going to be all of the links to everything that was discussed um, in this presentation. So when you guys get your follow-ups, you'll get that um, as well. Um, I am unable to leave my um, presentation screen to put the lunch and learn link if someone from the team can put that in for me. All right, and then I have some prompts here for some open discussion topics. Um, these include things like providing any feedback for CAC, um, if you want to reflect on some struggles with some goals that you might have set last year, um, do you want to share any stories of success towards your goals um, with your peers? Um, would you like to share any resources with your peers? Um, again, still open to asking questions regarding cultural heritage um, and anything else. Um, I do want to say thank you guys for taking the time to attend this convening today. If you have to go, um, have a great night. Thank you so much for attending. Um, and we'll go ahead and leave this open for any open discussions. I'm gonna go ahead and close the share screen so I can see everyone clearly. There was one more question here I'll mention too, if people are thinking of any questions they have for the group. Um, Donna asked if we'll be able to report virtually instead of a written report. So um, just like last year, we will have a mid-year check-in, which can be a call, a virtual meeting like this, or a get together with your grant manager. Um, and then the year-end report will be a written report. Um, we anticipate that it'll look similar to the one that you're looking at this year. We like to keep the formats relatively consistent so you can expect that. And it looks like Laura just plugged in the link to the Lunch and Learn about using clevelandartsevents.com. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. So let's get into some things. Anyone have any extra questions? Anyone want to share some resources? Anyone want to give us updates about their goals? Were there any specific goals that you thought were challenging last year that you had progress on? Um, we're not necessarily looking for everything to be completed, um, but it's always nice to hear how things are moving along and the progress that you made along the way. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Robin. All right. So I'm not. Yes, oh. I have one. <laughs> <laughs> this is maybe me repeating myself, but, um, you know, when, when trying to think about operationalizing equity in our own organization, I have found that it's really difficult and there's a lot of resources out there that kind of tell you why equity is good, but not how to plug it into your work. And, you know, part of that job belongs to us of figuring it out for ourselves. And I certainly acknowledge that. But I do also really think that the materials that the Othering and Belonging Institute shares for free on their website are truly super clear and they reframe it in a way that I think all types of organizations could benefit from. And so I do highly recommend looking into those materials. I've found that to be like a really useful, um, yeah, framework for, for thinking about making a place that anyone has the opportunity to feel like they belong in. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. Um, I really like how their layouts are. 
Um, they even have like case studies and examples for those who are like, I get the gist of it, but like, how did this play out? So I love seeing that as well um, recorded in their archives. I guess a question I might ask our grantees in the room is just like, do you, and maybe you don't even have an answer, that's okay, but like, do you, do you feel like your organization has recovered from the pause of the pandemic? Or do you feel like your organization has transformed permanently based on it and there's a new normal? Um, yeah, this is maybe just like a, a feeler question if anyone's interested in talking about it. I can sort of speak to that. Um, with regards to Cleveland Current we, uh, we, you know, we had to drastically shift, obviously, like everyone did um, in the first year of the pandemic in 21, and we went completely virtual. And, and what that did was it allowed us to really grow our audiences, not just outside of Cleveland, but outside of Ohio, um, and even further outside of the United States, we gained a lot of followers um, from Canada, from Europe, from even like places like Argentina and Australia um, and Japan also, now that I'm thinking of it. Wow. Um, and I think the way we, I would say we're at the point now where we're really preparing for our first year, quote unquote, back, um, where I feel like we're we're sort of out of the um chaos maybe <laughs> um but you know we've really taken a lot of things away we are still very much hybrid we are never going back to being in person only uh those audiences that we built are vital to us now they're part of our contingency and so um making sure that we're offering that um programming uh virtually as well as in person and then also figuring out how the in-person programming uh, can also be more inclusive, um, trying to focus on different topics so that we're, we're broadening our audience there as well. Um, and then furthermore, just from a safety and health perspective, we're, we're never going back to being an all indoor festival. We will forever be an indoor outdoor festival. So um I think it's changed us for the better. Maybe at first we didn't think so, but now, now I think we've definitely, um, in a way, grown to appreciate what we've become from it. Wonderful, wonderful. It's nice to hear that. COVID was a doozy, but um, I'm happy that you guys are, you know, turning it into something that benefits you guys. Um, and how you can operate. And also the reach that you guys are having is quite impressive. So congrats to that as well. Thank you. Um, I'll share a little bit. Um, our programming definitely is, had to um, be modified. And a lot of it has gone back, which is helpful. Um, but uh, similar to uh, Lauren was sharing, um, we also found new ways of doing things that will not go back. So um, I think everyone is kind of like ready to incorporate technology in a greater way. And, you know, the remote nature of a lot of things um, even the way that we work um, has changed. So, you know, the public facing as well as the internal workings of how we do things, um, you know, they're here to stay. Um, there'll never be a time when we won't incorporate some of the lessons we learned during the pandemic, sure. Yeah, the pandemic has definitely changed some things. Um, have you guys um from the programming, um, so what has like changed for your programming? The frequency, um, the size um of your events. I know that you guys do a lot of um 
events where you travel to different um, institutes, organizations? Has it just affected the frequency? Um, speak a little bit more about that for me, please. Uh, for, for a while, like all of our educational programs were virtual and only virtual. Uh, those have come back now to being in person at schools, libraries, um, institutions like that. Uh, but our community programs um, have taken on like a new approach in a lot of ways. Um, I know I mentioned earlier about my favorite program, which is when we partner with basic needs. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of basic needs outreaches are no longer um, the kind where you get, you know, a room full of people waiting around to, you know, get particular services, food, uh, things like that. A lot of it is drive through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that has definitely affected, you know, the way that we interact. Um, and, you know, we're just finding ways to kind of just partner with the new normals that everyone else has, um, you know, even with masks and, and things like that. Um, we're handing out you know, um, it used to be just like hygienic products, but, you know, a lot of it is like, you know, sanitary type stuff, um, you know, um, hand sanitizer and, and and things like that are really in demand still. So, um, you know, just just it was a fluctuation that took place, but. It it's here, it's here to stay. So, um, you know, the challenges of today somebody has to meet it. And I feel like if you don't alter your course, then you're just re less relevant. So we want to stay relevant. So we'll just keep pivoting. Love the resilience. Love that. Oh, well, let me look at the chat one more time. I don't see any new questions or comments. Um, so it's looking like we're gearing to wrap up. Um, but with that being said, um, like I mentioned, if you have any questions or concerns, you can always reach out to me, Julia or Maya, depending on who your grant manager is for assistance. Um, and I'll call it that for the evening. I'll let you guys go um, and we'll speak to you guys soon. Remember your due dates are January 31st. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thank yeah. you.